here we are at the, the, the 25th anniversary and uh, uh, sort of a word of thanks to uh, the, the people who've come along to, uh, to Cardiff and Lean Enterprise Research Centre and to the MSC over the, over the years. Uh, these, uh, these people have made a tremendous contribution and, uh, uh, and we, amongst them we have uh, some of the, the, the leading lights of, uh, of, of Lean, not, uh, not to mention Dan of course, uh, but more uh, local, but <clears throat> okay. So, what we'll be talking about today is uh, having a little bit of a look back, but also a, a look forward uh, and I hope a little bit of provocation about how to make uh, lean relevant over the next 25 years. So never mind the, the, the previous 25 years, focus on the, on the future. Okay. So, you know, first of all, uh, we've been very privileged and lucky to have uh, Toyota as being the, the great lean uh, uh, exemplar and uh, Toyota has been a, a continual source of, of inspiration and ideas in many many areas and uh, I think long may that continue absolutely uh, so that uh, I can't see any reason why that shouldn't happen um, however uh, however uh, two comments about this. One is that uh, here's Phil sitting in the front row uh, and uh, Phil got some, uh, uh, a chap, uh, Phil Rosenzweig uh, came to, to Cardiff and Phil Rosenzweig w w warned of the, of the possible dangers of the halo effect and uh, so, you know, okay, we've got Toyota and as I say, long may, may it continue, but we've also got to be uh, careful that, uh, that it's, it not becomes the sole, uh, uh, <coughs> if you like, halo that uh, <coughs> we're uh, looking into. Also, uh, I'd like to mention that Stephen Johnson, the, the, the writer on, on innovation, talks about many of the uh, significant innovations coming through what he calls the adjacent possible. So the, from adjacent fields and what is possible technologically, economically, politically, socially, and so on. And uh, we can draw on, the, uh, on the, the, uh, these developing fields as well. So, you know, um, uh, one thing that I think is a little bit uh, sort of, uh, of, of some concern to me is the, the idea of, of inventory turns. So uh, now I've been working with Richard Schonberger, who's, who actually visited here for, for some, from, some years, and uh, you know, I think uh, that uh, uh, this, uh, I think this is a little bit uh, of, of uh, possibly disturbing, but also uh, of, of of relevance. So this is not just Toyota, it's, uh, uh, it's what is happening in inventory turns in uh, not only in, in automotive but, uh, but also in uh, many other sectors. So, um, uh, so you know, as we see that uh, at the time that The Machine That Changed the World uh, was written, Toyota had uh, stellar inventory turns. But over the, the last uh, 30 years, there's been a convergence uh, uh, towards, uh, uh, in, in many other areas in, in, in automotive. And of course, uh, this, uh, uh, there are good reasons and, and poor reasons for, for this. So, uh, and I think it behoves us to, to have a look at what are, are the poor reasons, what are the bad reasons for, I mean, good reasons would be uh, things like uh, complexity and service. But poor, poor reasons would be, well, uh, things like uh, the, uh, maybe inappropriate uh, KPIs, cooking the books, failure to respond to technical changes and so on. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, so, you know, I think this is important because if this continues, uh, the, uh, uh, there's, a, there's the possibility of, of, of lean just becoming another kind of uh, idea. So, uh, you know, why of course is inventory turns important? Because of the link with, uh, with Little's Law, which is about uh, the, the link between inventory, uh, inventory uh, throughput and, uh, <coughs> and lead time. Okay, now, uh, so what about this? Um, well, you know, I, so why, is, why a lot uh, has this been happening? Well, uh, many, many reasons, but, but in all these models uh, that uh, we, can, we can draw on, and uh, you know, I like to use the, the phrase from my, uh, an old professor, so George Box, all models are wrong, some models are useful. So, uh, but uh, uh, George Box uh, uh, 
I think said that very powerful statement. But in all these the, the, these models of, of lean and house of lean and so on, uh, all of them have uh, emphasis of both on the people side and the process side. But uh, I think that uh, uh, there's been uh, a, or possibly been a bit of imbalance between the, uh, these sides. Now, for example, here's uh, what Toyota has been doing in uh, new global ar architecture, uh, which is something that really hasn't, uh, in my view, made such an impact in the, in the world of lean. Um, but it should have, because this is really uh, ex extremely uh, interesting and powerful stuff. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, you know, uh, over the last couple of years, I, I have meetings with operations di directors. And, uh, of course, uh, at these meetings, we often uh, talk about what, is the, what are the, uh, the issues. And many times, or almost invariably, people bring up the idea that it's culture and leadership is what it's all about. And, of course, culture and leadership are vitally important. No question about this. But uh, also, I think it's, uh, it's interesting that... Uh, a, a number of these operation directors really, uh, if, you qu if you question them, uh, find that maybe they don't know uh, as much as they should into, I think, fairly f sort of fundamental areas like, uh, say, for example, t attack time and, and Little's Law and variation and, uh, 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 and the... the uh, the impact of, of bottlenecks and upstream bottlenecks and so on. So, uh, okay, it's important to talk about culture and leadership and so on, but of course this culture and leadership need to be fitted in with uh, a, a wider appreciation of, of these sort of things. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, uh, in, in that respect, uh, you know, we've got the old idea of, of, of Muda, and by now Muda has become well established. Everybody in, in the uh, it seems to me everybody in the world knows about Muda and, and waste and so on. But uh, until pretty well recently, uh, the ideas of, of Muri and Muda, uh, Muri and Mura haven't been as, as prominent, and uh, they should have been. So uh, these are, are possibly areas that uh, we need to address more, uh, more effectively uh, in, in the future. So, you know, Wally Hopp being one of the people that, that came along to, uh, uh, to, to Cardiff here, he was saying that uh, there's only three uh, uh, fundamental ways, time, inventory, and capacity, and he, his point being that, you, that these are, are, are in fact trade-off ways, so trade-off acts that you need to uh, more, be more explicit uh, uh, in, in addressing. Now, this is something we talked about just on this theme uh, of, uh, of, of knowledge of, of actual operations. We, we, we had a workshop on this yesterday, and so I don't want to spend too much time about this. But, you know, uh, I think Kingman's equation is, uh, is an interesting uh, point because what it, uh, what it highlights is the, the, uh, the, the dangers of, or the, of, uh, of being in the high utilization area and, and how, uh, uh, how, how by being in the high utilization area with a bit of, of variation, that you're on the knife edge, you're on the knife edge, so that uh, a little bit of change can make an exponential difference uh, in, into your, your, your cues, your, your, uh, your lead time. And I think that this uh, aspect has not been uh, sort of sufficiently uh, appreciated. Moreover, I think that a lot of uh, people in the area of lean, are, and not only in lean, but also are more uh, c concerned with linearity, uh, li linear effects. But here we have exponential effects. So when you get to high utilization, the effects are, are, are exponential. So a little bit of changes makes a huge, huge difference. And I, I do believe that this is something that is not uh, sufficiently sort of appreciated. And, you know, we can link up this, uh, this uh, uh, Kingman's equation with uh, utilization load divided by capacity and in turn uh, load being made up of real demand and unnecessary demand. So uh, now, uh, and base capacity minus detractors, and I think these, uh, these factors actually join many of these uh, uh, aspects that we talk about in, in lean uh, together. So here's the crucial question is that 
uh, you know, how much of your load is, is unnecessary and uh, also how much of your load and your variation is self-caused. So self-caused uh, self variation. Uh, like, uh, just a, a quick example, like a, an MRP system. So in, in an MRP system, uh, you might have a, a default of a, say, planned order quantity, a period order quantity, goes through various levels of the bill of materials, and so what is a nice, uh, uh, a nice linear order book gets translated through the MRP system to a whole lot of lumpy demands. How many of your people that are working in the scheduling area know about that self-caused uh, 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 kind of uh, that's that self-caused <coughs> uh, 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 demand uh, variation? And of course, we've also got the ideas of uh, uh, unnecessary demand by a, a failure demand and, uh, 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 and and rework. Also, overproduction and, and superfluous demand, which have a uh, have a, once again an exponential effect. Okay, now we, we'll, we'll move on to say a few words about a uh, very hot topic, uh, Industry 4.0. But uh, so the uh, topic of this uh, talk is about uh, uh, old wine in new bottles and uh, new wine in old bottles and so on. So, well, okay, we have a look at uh, this Industry 4.0. Uh, I think it's interesting to uh, look back on, pub on publications like by David Edgerton saying that, in fact, uh, uh, it, that it, the, if you like, the in, uh, Industry 4.0, although he didn't call it that, was being talked about in the 1930s. So the, the, uh, also, uh, waste was a big theme, uh, according to uh, uh, David Edgerton, in the, uh, in, in the 1920s. Um, also, here's the point, is that, okay, we, uh, the Industry 4.0 is, is, is a hot topic, but uh, there's also been a whole lot of other revolutions that have, in, in a way, passed us by, uh, than what we've uh, looked at here. And, uh, you know, I, I do think that, uh, that although uh, Lean has made a tremendous lot of uh, advances in various areas, many of these uh, other, if you like, revolutions are still progressing, and we haven't really picked up on, uh, uh, on, on all of them. Okay, we mentioned the, the adjacent possible a, a, a minute ago, but uh, I think that uh, the, maybe the, the real revolution uh, that, is, uh, the, that is not very much spoken about is the, the revolution on, on per personal attitudes, on, on the ideas of, of people. Uh, this has been variously called the me revolution. So, uh, you know, the me revolution. So, uh, it goes back a long time, but. Uh, but, but Catch-22 has been on, on television, and, uh, uh, but in, in, in that, uh, in, you have this theory, theory about uh, or the, 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 the statement uh, saying that, well, um, uh, Eusarian, who's the, uh, who's the, the star of, of Catch-22, says, you know, uh, if, if I die in the Second World War, uh, it'll make no difference uh, to, to the war effort, but it'll make a heck of a difference to me. So this is about uh, the, the, the me idea, that we're not uh, so much concerned uh, as we once were with, uh, uh, with more uh, <coughs> uh, collective sort of work. So this, is, this has been something that we're talking about in, in various uh, in areas. And, you know, uh, so the, the reluctance for repetitive work, which is actually being uh, uh, experienced in, in, in now in... Uh, in, in many areas. So one of the things that uh, I've spoken about is, uh, uh, I've just highlighted the book here about saying that uh, uh, the move towards, if you like, moving towards uh, from, from tight to, 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 to so-called tight loose. So you need the idea of uh, tight operations, but also uh, uh, more loose on, on people. But, you know, uh, of course, uh, this uh, uh, Industry 4.0 is uh, certainly uh, very much concerned with uh, uh, unprecedented technology. And, uh, you know, um, we've got to, we can uh, just re recall the, the uh, f famous story about the, the, the magician who uh, says to the, the, the king, uh, after doing a, 
uh, some sort of breakthrough improvement, the king says to him, uh, what, uh, uh, what reward would you like? And the, the magician says, well, I'd like one grain of rice on my, uh, on my uh, draft board, uh, but I'd like the, the number to be doubled every quarter or every month. And so the king says, this is a wonderful bargain. And uh, wow, this is tr tremendous. But what happens uh, a little bit down the road is that we, because we're doubling it every month, pretty soon we're into uh, a billion or even a trillion. We, uh, pretty soon, after just three years, uh, we're consuming all the rice in the entire world. Uh, so what, this is like a Faustian bargain that, uh, that takes place. So, and, you know, I think that this is happening uh, just uh, uh, in, in Industry 4.0 as well because, uh, in, in fact, uh, Moore's Law, which, is, which, is, uh, which was actually first spoken about in 1995, wow, uh, is still, pre is still uh, forecasted to have a couple of years of life. So this is the, where the number of transistors on a... Or, uh, on, a, on a chip doubles uh, uh, every year. And we're getting to this, uh, this stage now where it, it really is becoming incredibly vicious. So this, uh, think about your, what your, your mobile phone, the power of a mobile phone is the power of a supercomputer. Uh, yeah, it, it, that, that's sort of coming. So uh, this means that there's all sorts of opportunities for the, the future of lean. And just, uh, just looking at, uh, uh, well, on the education side, uh, uh, last year here at, uh, at, the, uh, at a conference in Cardiff, uh, I met a, a Korean uh, industrial engineer. Of course, industrial engineering quite, uh, quite closely allied with, uh, <coughs> uh, with Lean. And he was talking about that he was introducing a, a, a so-called MOOC course, a, a massive online uh, open courses uh, that uh, is available th from, from the best provider around the world. And uh, he's saying that, in fact, in, in 2019, uh, students uh, from his Korean university could take the best course from, from a, a range of possible uh, universities, popular being Caltech, uh, uh, MIT, Imperial College. Uh, and uh, he envisages that uh, by uh, 2025, the whole curriculum will be on, on MOOC. So how about getting your lectures from the best people in the world? But also we need that uh, sort of hands-on idea that uh, we've, uh, we try to get going in the, the MSc in Lean, where you'll have a lot of on-site practicals and, and, and hands-on work. So this is maybe something that uh, uh, we can look forward to, or, or maybe look forward to. But uh, anyway, OK. But, you know, also uh, there's warnings about this. So I, I was intrigued by the, the work of, of Stanley McChrystal, who is the, the supreme uh, allied commander in, uh, in Afghanistan, saying that, you know, uh, what he found was that, uh, okay, uh, that although the, the United States and the, the allies had all the technology, all the firepower, uh, uh, they, were, they were nevertheless getting the run around by Taliban who just didn't have uh, anything like this. And so this became a, a big point of concern via Stanley McChrystal. So he uh, introduced this uh, more decentralized form of decision making to, in, to reinforce the uh, 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 the, the, the technology. So what we say is that, uh, that as he said, if efficiency remains important, but the ability to adapt to complexity has become uh, an imperative. So this is working with people. It's not uh, technology. Uh, com uh, it's not necessarily the, the, the threat of technology. It's how to, how to work more significantly with it. So you know, he was also talking about, for example, uh, uh, Lord Nelson, uh, he, in his opinion, saying that this was really uh, the uh, the effectiveness of, of Lord Nelson was not his famous battle plan at Trafalgar, but it was the idea that those, uh, those captains of the, of the British fleet could uh, act independently, and he trained them to act independently. Okay. So, uh, now, all this, uh, this move towards, if you like, loose, uh, 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 brings on quite a, a number of, of uh, I 
think, new and exciting possibilities. Some of them, well, some, some not so new. Something that has been going around for a long time, but has perhaps been somewhat missed by the, the, the lean community is, is the uh, area of open book management, which is, uh, uh, open book management, has, as you say, has been around for quite a time, and I, I've visited a, a number of open book management companies where if essentially, uh, uh, basically, everybody, or maybe everybody in the in company, if it's a small company, or everybody in a cell, if, a, if it's a larger company, knows everything about it. So they know all the, the, the financials, and they know everything that's uh, about the, the, the strategy uh, uh, in that particular s uh, section. And with the idea that if we're all working together, uh, it's good for continuous improvement and, uh, uh, and, and innovation and, and, and productivity in, in general. So I think that, we, that uh, the open book management uh, area is certainly gaining a lot of, of attention now. Uh, again, after a long uh, period of, uh, of gestation. Also, uh, the, uh, I think many of you, many of you will be uh, familiar with the, uh, the, the book uh, by uh, Lalou on, on reinventing organizations where he talks about so-called teal organizations or he got five-stage uh, procedure. And, you know, many of the organizations that we, we work with, in fact, are, if you like, in Lalou's terms, he would talk about them as being a stage three, and whereas stage five, five is much more sort of participative, open, uh, and, you know, I think one of the, the interesting uh, e examples of, of this uh, is, is Haya. The Haya, the, uh, the now the largest, of, for some years now, the, the, the largest uh, uh, <coughs> um, uh, home appliance uh, manufacturer in the world, which in fact uh, has decentralized into 4,000 mini businesses each of which are, are pretty well uh, sort of independent and, and have to, if you like, compete with one another and also support one another. So this is a, 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 a big revolution towards uh, the empowerment of, of people uh, at, at lower levels. And also, you know, the, uh, I think i am also been uh, lucky enough to be able to study the, 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 the Quaker uh, church, uh, which, has been, which has been going, of course, now for 350 years. So they're decision-making procedures are very interesting that they work via sort of consensus uh, basis uh, but uh, and uh, the but they don't vote uh, it's, there's no hierarchy no uh, there's no uh, no ministers no hierarchy so it's completely flat organization by the way did you know that uh, in Britain at least uh, uh, Quaker if you're a, if you're a, a Sort of legit Quaker, uh, you you and your partner can marry yourselves. Uh, did you know that? Uh, so they w what they think is that it's between you and your partner and God. We don't want anything to do with the, the, uh, the kind of a, a minister or a priest or whatever. It's just uh, so I think this is interesting. So uh, uh, and their their uh, procedures of of, uh, of decision making, I think, is worthy of, of a lot of attention. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think uh, in, in this regard, I was quite intrigued by uh, finding out about uh, pirate organizations. So you think, oh, pirates, now what the heck have they got to do with all, all this stuff? But it turns out, actually, that pirates are a, are a, had an incredibly lean kind of uh, operation. Uh, so, you know, uh, in fact, uh, pirates, they didn't want to fight, actually. They, why did they didn't want to fight? Because they might lose their lives. So they, uh, they, their methodology was to scare the hell out of uh, their opposition by all these uh, kind of uh, uh, scary outfits and terrible uh, stories but you know uh, but uh, of course this was all, all uh, they were all volunteers mutual training information available to all uh, mutual ownership no organizational hierarchy um, uh, or job titles except the, the, the uh, except the captain and the mate and uh, hey, here's an interesting one, profit sharing, Pro uh, uh, profit sharing by, by all, all gain, but a, a maximum of three to one. How about comparing that with the, whatever we have today, 3,000 to one or something in, in some of these organizations? Yeah, so, you know, uh, I think we've got a lot to learn from pirate organizations, uh, as opposed to what Churchill said about the, the Royal Navy at the time, where it was, uh, 
uh, operating on the basis of press gang sodomy and the lash. So this was kind of <laughs> not very desirable. Okay. And, you know, uh, here's a little case study on, on really relating to the uh, uh, a, a more loose uh, type of organization. So I, I don't know how many of you know the, 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 the story about what happened by, uh, during the Vietnam War, but uh, there was, a, uh, at the time, the, 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 the United States, and by the way, also a little known fact, there were RAF pilots flying in that, uh, in that conflict as well. Uh, so um, uh, the, 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 US, um, the main US plane was the Air Force Phantom, which was an incredibly muscular kind of plane. Uh, 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 fighter bomber, 2.2 uh, Mach, uh, so really outperformed ev uh, everything around. But uh, uh, the, the, the methodology was uh, they would go through a, a training program and then, uh, uh, then the pilots were expected to fly combat missions. And what they found was that uh, their, their kill ratio, in other words, how many North Vietnamese were shot down as opposed to how many of their, their own, uh, was relatively modest, uh, uh, I think in the, uh, of the order of about, uh, of about 2 or 1.8, something like that. But then uh, this is uh, what happened uh, in, in the middle of the, uh, later on in the uh, Vietnam War, was that uh, a truce was called by Kissinger and, uh, and Nixon uh, to try and get the North Vietnamese to, to come around and talk on the, about the uh, about possibilities of peace. And, uh, so during this period, uh, the, 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 two, uh, the two bodies that were flying this, the, the F-4 Phantom, uh, being the, the US Navy and the US Air, uh, Air Force, actually uh, had different policies. So what the, the United States Air Force did was they continued to have this uh, pr procedure about training and then flying. But the US Navy uh, decided that uh, they would do so, something differently. Uh, and that was to uh, have a bit of training, but also to use their own best pilots to fly uh, simulated combat missions against their, their, own, uh, their own United States pilots. Uh, so that in fact, uh, uh, they were exposed to real combat sort of conditions. And moreover, all of that was, was filmed in detail. Uh, and so uh, uh, as a follow-up, uh, followed through by a detailed look at what happened and why, where, where the mistakes, uh, where, 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 where mistakes were made and so on. And uh, so uh, then uh, after the, uh, the bombing of North Vietnam was, was resumed, uh, uh, the United States Air Force actually, their kill ratio stayed pretty well the same, but the, the United States uh, uh, the U.S. Navy, which this became known as the Top Gun story, which is uh, an old movie and now a newer movie, uh, there, there was a dramatic difference. So this is this is kind of uh, I think the implications of this are very interesting from a from a from a, a lean learning perspective. So it's not just sitting in the classroom uh, and, and getting the theory as per the U.S. Air Force and then exposing guys with a bit of luck to uh, uh, to the real situation. It's really uh, uh, more, more active learning. And this was then transferred to the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the US uh, Army, which uh, had, uh, uh, which this was called After Action Reviews, and uh, uh, the history of After Action Reviews, as talked about by David Garvin, uh, the late David Garvin of Harvard Business School, uh, is kind of interesting because uh, the, the, the effect of these After Action Reviews only works uh, if you have this participation, uh, uh, the, uh, the idea of, of looking at objective data, no criticism, uh, and, and so on. So that's, that's a little, nice little case study on, uh, on the way we should be thinking about this. And of course, this fits in very uh, nicely with the, the work of, uh, of Mike Rother on, on, on Toyota Kata. So I'll, I'll lead you to, I'll, uh, I'll leave you to, re to read uh, that, that this comment by Anders Ericsson uh, uh, on this uh, sort of thing, but okay. But then, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we're now very strongly into sort of um, A, uh, A3 thinking and uh, all, this is, all, all of this is, is good on problem solving, and, uh, but uh, I think many of you guys will have, have uh, come across the work of uh, <coughs> uh, 
God's money, who talks about four types of problem solving. And uh, what, he's, uh, what he's saying that in say, say type two and type three, this is the, this is the classic area for the application of, uh, uh, <coughs> of, of A3 kind of thinking. But if you get into type four, uh, where you need more open-ended, more uh, where you've got, if you like, so-called wicked problems, uh, then you need to have uh, a more wider viewpoint. So the ideas, back to, to Stephen Johnson, the ideas of the, the adjacent possible. You need to have, uh, to bring in ideas from, from outside of your domain uh, because in fact uh, this is uh, the way to, to make, uh, make progress. So the, this is also, uh, this also referred as to the Einstelling effect. Uh, this is where you, where you focused on your own little area but don't look outside of future areas. So I think this work of Art Smalley uh, and echoed by other people like Gary Klein and uh, 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 Many of you guys will be aware of the work of, of uh, Kahneman Tversky, where they're talking about uh, the, the inside view and the outside view. And, uh, and uh, you know, also, uh, we feel like one of my heroes, uh, Gene Woolsey, whose uh, little CV is uh, uh, there, give, give, give you the flavor of what he was, what he, what he was about. Um, you know, he did a, uh, an, an interesting um, decision-making course for our, uh, our MSc students. Uh, and uh, what he did was uh, that the, uh, the, the core texts for that he required were things like uh, chapters from the Bible, the Koran, uh, Shakespeare, uh, things like uh, the um, <coughs> uh, 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 <coughs> the ideas of uh, 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 of, uh, of people from uh, from all sorts of uh, interesting works of life, and none of, and none of them from actually the core management area. So uh, I think, and and you know, actually, uh, just uh, t two or three weeks ago, I met up a, of a previous student who, uh, and you know, first thing he said to me is, "Wow, I remember Woolsey. Wow, I remember Woolsey because he had the most uh, incredible effect uh, uh, on my future career." By, uh, if you like, not focusing on all these kind of uh, things, but uh, these standard ideas, but if you like, widening out their viewpoints. I think this is this is uh, interesting, and also the uh, the uh, more more recent research saying about the uh, if you like, if you've got this idea of if you make research more uh, at least teaching easier and and uh, where you give hints on on how it works, that makes you popular. But it's not very good for retention. So, uh, yeah. So, requiring self-discovery uh, is slower, less popular, but but far better for retention. Okay. So uh, now this also leads on to the idea of what he calls small wins. So small wins is um, <coughs> something that is very, uh, I think, relevant in the area of uh, of of lean, so uh, well, like with Mike Rother and so on, but it's also become quite a, a, a big thing in this, uh, that, uh, so the work of, uh, of uh, Amabile and Kramer talking about the, the power of small, of, of small wins. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, small wins by itself is, is, is okay and very powerful, but you need to link it up with, with two other things that are, are, are relevant in the, in the field of lean. So that is repetition or deliberate practice that we were talking about just a minute ago. And the idea of, well, I'm going to call this phrase yet. That's a phrase from, from Carol Dweck. So she talks about, you know, for example, I can't, you can't do mathematics yet. But hang in there, you know, I don't have this idea that uh, you, you can't do mathematics full stop, but have the idea that, uh, that uh, you can uh, develop people. And so these are people that have contributed in this area. Uh, but in the, in the, in the lean area, uh, we've, we've got people that have uh, been saying the same sort of thing. So, for example, Ian Glenday on the economics of repetition and Mike Rother and uh, Patrick Graup on, 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 uh, on job instruction and, uh, okay, and so on and so on. <coughs> okay. and finally, uh, also, this is something that I've been uh, kind, of, uh, kind of interested in. Uh, they're really linking in with us is that um, <coughs> this idea of, of, if you like, bullshit. Well, th now that sounds uh, kind, of, uh, kind of a bit strange, but uh, actually it's become something that, that has become quite uh, quite prominent, actually. Uh, 
So, uh, of course, uh, well, bullshit has been around for a long time, and we've got these sort of statements uh, like we're talking about there. But, but in fact, uh, maybe Parkinson in the 1950s, or Parkinson's law, work expansive all the time available, uh, but now more, uh, uh, <coughs> more writing and more interest in, the, in this area. So just some, some, some sort of quick examples. A company that, uh, a supermarket company, uh, will be nameless, that I had a uh, sort of bit to do with, uh, uh, actually had a, a chief executive some years ago, and shortly after the arrival of this chief executive, he made 900 people in the, in the head office re uh, redundant. About four or five months later, uh, the people that I spoke to in the, in, the, in the head office were saying, you know, those five, 900 people have gone, and I, uh, I don't know what they did. Wow, is this bullshit? Uh, this is kind of interesting. And uh, also, in the, in the area of, uh, uh, of education, you know, the, uh, the number of professors and so on have, have more in, in education uh, some universities that I know about, the, you know, the number of, uh, of professors, lecturers, have more or less tracked the number of students. But the number of administrators has gone up by a factor of four or, or so. Wow, now what are all those people doing? This is, this is the area. Now, of course, this is, uh, uh, they, they, many of them are doing good things, but, uh, but I really suspect that, and these guys, a lot of these people suspect uh, uh, otherwise uh, on a lot of that. So what are, what are some of these things that are going on that I think this is an area that uh, we need to uh, devote some attention to in the area of lean. So the, these sorts of things like uh, non-trusters, uh, you know, including checkers, time fillers, uh, wasted word generators. In, in, the, in the field of, of, uh, of academia, you know, the figures are horrific about uh, the number of papers that are read by, there's a strong Pareto in this. So some papers are read by a huge number of people, but there are a lot of papers that are read by almost none. So this is the, 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 the waste of wasted words. Uh, rule sticklers, target wallers uh, that are, for example, accountants that are chasing uh, 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 variances and so on. Buck passes, glorifies people spending time uh, on their CVs and uh, and uh, also other things. So, you know, and I think that uh, here's a little, little suggestion to uh, to kind of end with here. We've, we've we know about the the seven wastes, and we know about the eighth waste of people, and about the ninth about the waste of resources. How about the tenth waste, the waste of bullshit? So this is uh, uh, yeah, okay. So. There we go. Uh, so finally, uh, we'd say, uh, no, we're in a uh, situation of a lot of change. So uh, to quote uh, John Maynard Keynes or uh, Sir Paul Samuelson, the economist, saying, when the facts change, I change my mind. So these, we're in a situation where a lot of the facts are, are changing. So maybe we should change our mind on some of these. Uh. Yes, I, I, once again, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think this is a, a particular p a point of concern. And, uh, you know, I think uh, a lot of education needs to take uh, uh, more notice of, of the, the way we're doing things in Lean by uh, theory plus, uh, plus practice uh, together. <laughs>